If you have your Bibles, you can turn to James. James chapter 1. We're going to continue our study. It's, it's been a while since we've been in James. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18 this morning. And while you're turning there, I read a story of a man who was on a diet. He was struggling with his diet, and he had to go run some errands downtown. And when he got going, he remembered that his route was going to take him right past the donut shop. And so as he got closer, he thought, you know, a nice cup of coffee would hit the spot. But then he remembered, my diet can't go there. So he prayed, Lord, if you want me to stop for a donut and coffee, let there be a parking place right in front of the shop. Sure enough, he said, I found a parking spot right in front of the store on my seventh time around the block. <laughs> Temptations are a part of life. And they have been ever since God, ever since sin entered into God's perfect world. When we face temptation, though, we want to blame somebody. And can this man blame God that there is a parking space in front of the shop, even though it was the seventh time around? Can he blame God? We as humans have a tendency to want to point the finger at somebody uh, for our sins, for our problems. I mean, look at our society today. We live in a society of victims. No one ever wants to take responsibility for anything that they do. It's always somebody else's fault. My parents, right? If I wasn't raised this way, then I wouldn't have turned out this way. If I didn't live in this environment, I wouldn't have turned out this way, right? If I didn't have these circumstances, I would have been a better person. Maybe it's my DNA. Our sinful hearts make us so self-righteous that whenever we sin, whenever we have problems, it can't be my fault because I'm me. So whose fault is it when we sin? And that's what James is going to get at. But we have an example in Exodus that I want to read to you, which I find humorous, uh, of pointing the finger at somebody else. In Exodus 32, we have the account of the golden calf. Uh, Moses confronts Aaron and says, uh, in verses 21 to 24, I just want to read it to you because it makes me laugh and it illustrates the point well. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they're set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So I said to them, Let any of you who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. (laughs) Don't don't look at me, Moses. I, I don't know what to tell you. First of all, it's this people. They like evil. And then I threw some gold in the fire and poof! We like to point the finger at ridiculous things, even if it's that. And our passage this morning deals with temptation and to sin and ultimately who's to blame for it. And up until this point, since it's been a while, uh, James has focused his message on trials, on the inevitability of trials, that we're going to deal with trials in our lives. Uh, And that ultimately trials are going to be used by God For a purpose, to make us more like Jesus Christ, to produce endurance. And so, he says, then as God uses those trials in our lives, we often lack wisdom. So we need to ask for it. And we need to ask for it in faith uh, in order to deal with those trials rightly. The last time we were in James, we looked at some specific trials, the trials of riches and and poverty. Uh, And so, and he says in those trials that we need to look at the right thing. We need to have our focus in the right place on our eternal riches that we have in Christ. And so now, James turns his attention to temptation. Because often, when we face trials, temptations like to tag along with them. For example, the last time in the riches and and poverty, when we have wealth, which is a trial, as we looked at, um, a lot of times we have the temptation to rely on those riches instead of relying on God. That's a temptation for us. Or maybe we have the temptation to pursue more wealth rather than pursuing God. Or if we're poor, we face the temptation of pursuing money, trying to get out of the poorhouse, rather than pursuing God. Or maybe we're tempted to be angry at God, because I should be blessed like that person over there is. Or maybe we're tempted to uh, steal, if we're poor. And so, any kind of hardship that we deal with, any kind of trial that we deal with, there's always a temptation to sin there. And so now James warns his readers not to blame God. So God may be directly or indirectly involved in bringing trials into your life or allowing them to come into your life, 
But don't get caught into the trap of thinking that because he's allowing the trials, that he's somehow responsible for bringing the temptations as well. And that's what James is cautioning his readers against. So let's look at James 1, verses 13 through 18. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, uh, whom you've given us, enabling us to... Uh, obey your word. And Father, we pray that as we look into your word this, this morning, that you would magnify yourself, uh, that you would magnify the name of Jesus Christ, and that uh, you would enable us to, to live in a way that would please him. We pray that you would receive all glory and honor for all that we do this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so James basically says in his command, don't blame God for your sin or for your temptations. He says temptations, just like trials, are inevitable. We're going to face them. We can't go through life without facing either one. Uh, We're going to deal with trials. We're going to deal with temptations. And while trials may come, like I said, directly or indirectly from God, temptations do not. The word for temptation here is the same word for trial. And what's the difference between them? What are temptations? Well, I think we probably all have somewhat of an idea of what that is. Temptations are essentially an enticement to do evil or an invitation to sin. And trials are tests to prove one's character. Trials come into our life for a purpose, for a beneficial purpose, to make us mature. Temptations do not. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, temptations like to tag along with trials. They like to come with them. Uh, Temptations come when we have a wrong view of our trials. When we deal with a difficulty, we're often tempted to question God's love for us. Right? If I'm dealing with this trial, how can, can God really love me if I'm facing this? Right? That's a temptation, to doubt God's love. When we see suffering in the world, there's a temptation to question God's character. Atheists are good at that. Right? How can there be evil? Well, how can you know that there's such thing as an evil if there's no good, no good God? But God can and will test us to bring us to maturity, but he will never tempt us. And so he says, let no one say... When he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. And so what he's saying there is, let no one say to themselves. Don't get into this this line of thinking that, okay, I'm dealing with this, so it must be God's fault. James says, don't even think that God is in any way to blame for your temptation. Don't entertain the thought. That's what he's saying. And so evidently, these believers that James is writing to had fallen into this trap of indirectly blaming God for their temptations. Because it's easy to point the finger at God. He's is sovereign. He's in charge. Right? So, then it must be his fault for either making me the way that I am or putting me in this situation. And blaming God is nothing new. It's the oldest trick in the book. It's been happening since sin entered the world. Right? Eve pointed, well, blame shifting too. Eve pointed the finger at the serpent. Adam pointed the finger at Eve, but ultimately at God. Things were fine, God, until you brought this woman into my life, which I'm sure he slept on the couch for a few nights for that. Um, but he ultimately blames God. You know, things were great between us. Then you brought this woman and messed it all up. We like to point the finger, but we like to point the finger at God. And so we think that if God brings a trial in our lives, then somehow he must be responsible for how I act in those trials. If God didn't sit, sit me next to the, uh, uh, the smart kid in class, then I wouldn't have cheated on the test, right? So it's, it's God's fault. Maybe we don't even mention God's name, but if... Uh, If I had more money, then I wouldn't be tempted to steal, or I wouldn't be tempted to uh, be so obsessed with money. Or if I had less money, I wouldn't be so tempted. If I didn't go through this pain, I wouldn't be hooked on painkillers. Right? And when you say that, indirectly, even if you don't mention God's name, you're saying, well, it's God that put me in this situation. It's God that allowed me to go through this. So if God didn't do this, or if God answered my prayer the way that I wanted him to, then I wouldn't have had to do this. I wouldn't have had to fill in the blank, whatever it is. 
It's easy to point the finger at God for our sin because, like I said, we want to blame somebody because surely it's not our fault. Not us. We're, we're the good guys, right? We're the best guys we know. We're the best people we know. That's our nature. And Will Rogers said that there are two periods in American history, the passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. And we live in the age of the passing of the buck. If God didn't put me in this mess, I wouldn't be so angry. If God didn't make me go through this or allow me to go through this, I wouldn't be depressed. So ultimately, it's God's fault, right? That's what James is warning against. He says, no, no, you don't get to blame God for your sin. God is not responsible for your temptation or for your sin. It's not His fault. It's never been His fault. Sin and evil exist because ultimately God gave His creatures freedom. And freedom is a good thing. We would all agree on that. But it was man that messed it all up, and it's man that still messes it up. Even as believers, we have the freedom not to sin, but guess what? We often still sin. And it's not God's fault, but it's easier to blame God than it is to blame ourselves for our sins and our failings. And so James says, okay, don't blame God. Why? Why not? And he gives us some reasons. And he says, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God cannot be tempted with evil. He cannot be tempted in the sense that he will ever give in or ever could give in to temptation. And the phrase cannot be tempted in the Greek carries the idea that he's untemptable. It's impossible. It's an impossibility for him to be tempted with any kind of evil or or wickedness because of who he is. Evil is completely foreign to him. It's impossible. And so because of that, he doesn't tempt anyone either. Because God is is completely good. And we don't fully understand what that looks like. Because we are not completely good. We're far from it. But God is morally pure. He's morally upright, holy. He's set apart and separated from sin. He's not tainted by it. He's the ultimate standard of what is good. He's holy, pure, and, and, and he cannot cause evil in any way. John MacArthur, in his commentary, says it this way. He says, God is untouched by evil like a sunbeam shining on a garbage dump is untouched by the trash. It doesn't affect it. It can affect it. It doesn't make the sunbeam stink. Uh, And God can't be tainted with sin or evil either. Habakkuk 1.13 says, You are of purer eyes than to see evil, and you cannot look at wrong. And then Habakkuk says, Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk was struggling with the fact that the wickedness and violence seemed to be running rampant, and it appeared that God was not doing anything about it. So he complains to God, and God answers by saying that he was going to do something about it. He was going to use the wicked nation of Babylon to punish Judah, which is why Habakkuk's like, How can you do that? Because you are so pure and you are so holy, you can't even look at wrong. He understood God's character, which is why he was having a hard time with what God was going to do. But ultimately, it was that God cannot stand evil or wickedness. That's his character. Job says the same thing. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. And Psalm, for you are not a God, Psalm 5, 4, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you, it says. And in 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. And so we often ask the question, is anything impossible with God? Yes. The answer is yes. God cannot be tempted with evil. And God cannot tempt others with evil as well, either. Evil is the opposite of who God is. He hates it, and he's separate from it, and so it's impossible for him to tempt others with it. And that's what James says here. You can't blame God because God doesn't have anything to do with it, with evil. And then so... Where does it come from? So who is to blame? If God's not to blame, then who do I blame for my sin and my temptation? Verse 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I mean, we like to think that the problem is God or other people or circumstances, but God says here that the problem is with us. The problem is our own hearts. No one else and nothing else can cause us to sin. People and problems only reveal what's already in our hearts. If we ask our kids why they hit their brother, they're not typically going to say, well, you know why, Dad? It's because my selfish, sinful heart. No, they're going to say it was his fault. It was my brother's fault. 
I mean, I would be nice if they, if they said that, but that's typically not what's going to happen. It was his fault. He made me do it. Right? It's always somebody else's fault. But James says, no, no, no. No, your sin is your fault. It's not God's fault. It's not anyone else's. It, it's mine. And then he says, uh, he says that it begins with desire. Then it goes to deception, then disobedience, and then, and then death. And that's the, that's the progression. He says it begins, temptation and sin begins with desire, our own desire. We are responsible for how we react to temptation, how we respond in trials, because we are ultimately the ones at fault. It's our sinful heart. And that's what Jesus says in Mark 7, 21 through 23. He says, from, for from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, a wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So who do we get to blame for us? And do we get to blame uh, our, our spouse, our children, our brothers, our sisters, uh, God? No, we don't get to blame any of those. Now, even here, uh, James doesn't even mention Satan. He will later on. But here, the blame is strictly on us. And he says something interesting, too, that we are drawn away by our own lusts. Ultimately, we will face temptation, and we're going to face unique temptations based on our own personal desires. So, in other words, what, a, what is a temptation for you may not be a temptation for me. Right? What's a temptation for one person may not be the same thing for another. Right? Some people are tempted by uh, drugs and alcohol. I mean, for me, not appealing at all. But some people really struggle with that. Right? It's the same thing with food. Right? I could have a, a nice juicy steak for some of us, Jeremy, um, that would be a great temptation. For others, it might be a plate of cookies, especially Leanne's cookies. Right? That's a temptation. Right? So we're wired a little bit differently. We have different temptations based on uh, life experience, based on uh, various things, and so certain things are, are weaknesses for us. Some are tempted for, to gossip, right? Some are more tempted toward anger, complaining, worry, whatever it is. Satan knows those weaknesses. And he mentions Satan later in, in the book. Um, but Satan will play on those things. So it's important for you and me to know our weaknesses. The man in the beginning had a weakness for donuts. Um, and so you should have recognized that. Um, but it's important for you and me to know our weaknesses uh, so that we don't get ourselves in situations that we shouldn't be in. So we know how to get ourselves out. And so we can stay clear of those things that are going to, to cause us to maybe sin. And so James says everyone is tempted when they are drawn away of their own desire, their own lust, and enticed. And so our temptation begins there. It's not God's fault. It's our own sinful desires. And when Jesus was tempted, it was purely an external temptation. He didn't have any desire to sin like you and I do. Uh, his temptation was from the outside. He didn't battle with these sinful thoughts or desires or, or struggles that we do that we've inherited from Adam because Christ did not inherit it from Adam. So then he goes, it's our desires, but then we're also deceived. He says he's drawn away of his own lust and he's enticed. He's drawn away and enticed. Uh, to be drawn away means to be dragged out, to be lured out of a place of safety. And the word enticed means to, to bait. And the words were hunting and fishing terms that were used to lure out an animal or, or a fish from a place of safety so you could catch them. Um, and that's what temptations are. They're a baited hook. They may look like what we want or what we need, what we desire, but in the end it's just going to trick us and take us captive, just like when you go fishing. Some of you, I mean, if you catch anything. Um, me, not so much. Uh, we put the bait on the hook, right, to lure the fish out, and the fish sees it, expecting, oh, this looks good. This is going to fulfill my desires. I have a desire to fill my belly. And so I'm going to go for this. So it's, it's deceptive. I'm going to grab it. Then they grab it. And then what's going to lead to? Death, right? Um, they get hooked. And then they get cooked. Um, that's what happens with sin. It's our desire to take the bait that causes us to sin. And certain baits work for certain fish. And certain baits work for certain people. What's the bait that can hook you? You know it. Satan knows it. You know your weaknesses. It's our fault when we get caught up in sin. The temptation appeals to our desire. It deceives us into thinking it will give us something good. And then it 
leads us to disobedience, and then that leads to death. In baseball, a pitcher looks at scouting reports for each batter to find out his weakness. His weaknesses. Can he hit a curveball? Will he chase out of the zone with two strikes or whatever? The batter looks at scouting reports on the pitcher. They want to find the weakness so they can take advantage of it. Satan does the same thing with us. He knows our weaknesses. And he's going to take advantage of it. He's going to exploit those weaknesses. He's going to attack us in areas by deceiving us. Starts with our desire, but then we have the deception by Satan or whatever else, playing on those desires. And then when desire and deception get together, it gives birth to sin. And that's what James says here. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. When we act on that desire, it gives birth to sin. That's disobedience. And that leads to death. And that's been that way since the beginning. In Genesis 2, uh, God said, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will die. For the wages of sin is death. Sin produces death. And in Scripture, death is seen as separation. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin brings about three types of death. Physical death, which is separation of the body and soul. Spiritual death, which is the separation of the soul from God. And then there's eternal death, which is the separation of the body and soul from God forever. And so as believers, we are saved from spiritual and eternal death. But as John MacArthur points out, he says if you persist in sin, you may pay the penalty of physically, physical death. There were some in Corinth, as we will mention earlier, and we do when we go to the Lord's table, uh, of some people that had made a mockery of the Lord's table, and they died. Uh, we think of Ananias and Sapphira in the early church. They had lied to the Holy Spirit, and what happened to them? They died. But James here isn't necessarily distinguishing what kind of death. He's, talking about, uh, he's not talking about whether it's for the saved person or the unsaved person or anything like that. What he is pointing out is that all that sin is going to lead to is death. It may promise you the world, it may promise you good, but the only thing it's going to bring about is death, separation of one sort or another. It may look good, temptation, it may appeal to our desires, it may promise to do something for us that may make us happy, uh, may uh, entertain us, it may promise us something that may say that it can do something for us that God can't do, but in the end, it's going to bring consequences. Painful painful consequences. That's all sin can bring. It can't bring anything good. It can't do anything for us. And so James goes on to say in verse 16, do not err my beloved brethren. In other words, stop being deceived. Stop being led astray and thinking that God is to blame because he can't be. These Jewish believers were somehow blaming God for their temptations to sin and he says stop it. Don't be tricked any longer. Understand that it's your fault. We have to point the fingers at ourselves. Because God is not the source of, of death. He's the source of life. He's the source of good. And that's what he says in verses 17 and 18. He says, don't blame God because God is good. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be kind of, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Satan from the very beginning has tried and succeeded in getting people to doubt the goodness of God. And if he could get you to doubt the goodness of God, then, especially in trials, then he can get you to sin. Right? Well, why would God be bringing this into your life if he loved you? Right. That's true. Maybe God isn't good. Right? That's how it starts. And that's what Satan wants. And that's what he's wanted since the beginning. He tricks Eve into thinking that God is withholding something from them. Right? And that's how he gets her to sin. Well, if God was so good, you know, why, would he, why would he keep this tree from you? I wouldn't. Right? That's, that's how Satan works. And that's how sin works. If we can be tra- tricked into thinking that God is somehow not good, but James says, no, no. Every good thing that you have, is from God. God's surely not going to bring sin, in, or sin into your life. He's not going to tempt you with sin because He's responsible for the good that you have. Not the sin that you're committing. 
God is good. He's not the source of temptations. He's the source of victory over temptations. So instead of blaming Him for our sin, we need to look to Him and thank Him for the blessings that He's graciously given us. That's what James is saying here. And he says, every good gift and every perfect gift, and those are two different words for gifts, uh, the first use speaks of the act of giving, while the second is the actual gift. Literally, it would be, you could read it this way. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above. And good, of course, means good. And perfect means complete. It means lacking nothing. Uh, it means everything that we have that is good and beneficial is from God in order to make us complete, in order to make us more holy, in order to make us more like Jesus Christ. And that's what James is trying to show us. In contrast to temptation, sin, and death, God provides gift that, gifts that lead to life and hope. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It's those things that, that produce life. God is not the source of temptation. He doesn't deserve the blame because God is the source of good things. He, said, he calls, James calls God the Father of lights. That is, he is the creator of the sun, the moon, and the stars. That he is the source of light. He is the source of, of morality, of, of truth, of, of purity, of holiness. And unlike the shadows of the sun, which do change, depending on the day it is, God's character never changes. And so he is good and perfect, so that everything that comes from him, therefore, must be good and perfect. It can't be sin, it can't be temptation, it can't be evil, because God, that is foreign to him. What God is, is perfect. And he's not going to change, because he doesn't need to change. Because perfection doesn't need to be improved upon. It doesn't need to change. So don't be deceived into thinking that God has anything to do with sin, evil, or temptation. Remember that God is good, and he will always be good, and he will always give good. What are some of those good gifts that God has given us? Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So God has given us the greatest good, Christ, and salvation through Jesus Christ, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he gave us the greatest gift of all in Jesus Christ, in his Son, and that is eternal salvation through him. And look at... Uh, verse 18, he says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He says it's God that brings about new life in Christ. That God is the one that we can thank for the fact that we can be saved at all. Without God deciding and determining to save sinners by sending his son, nobody could be saved. Ever. And so... God is good. Always. Even in trials. And God is not responsible for temptations because God is good. And it says He brought us to new life through the word of truth. That is through His word. That is through the gospel specifically. But one of the gifts that He's given us is the gospel message and the scriptures. He's also given us the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who works in us to give us the desire and an ability to obey God. The fact that any of us have any desire at all to obey God is because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Because before salvation, there is no desire. There's no wanting to please God. But now, through Christ, He has given us His Word, but He's also given us His Spirit, who gives us the desire to be like Him. He also gives us trials, which never seem like a blessing. But as we read at the beginning, our study, they're being used to make us more like Christ. So, God gives us perfect and good gifts that save us from our sins and make us more holy. 2 Peter 1, 3-4 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that though, through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So it is in Christ that God has graciously gifted us or granted us everything that we need to become godly people. This is the greatest good that anyone could do. This is the greatest good that we could hope for, to be in Christ and to be growing in Christ. And that's what God gives us. 
But on top of that, God gives us so many other things as well. Right? Just think of the good things that God has given you. Right? He's given you this country, really. I mean, think about what we have in this country. It, it, for all its problems, we're pretty blessed to live in this country. We have life. We have food. We have shelter. We have family. We have freedom. We have love. We have so many things that we could go on. And God has showered us with all of those blessings. So he's given us things that we need, but then he's also given us things that we want. Right? None of us are lacking. And some of those things aren't even uh, necessities that we have. Right? We have dozens of, of phones, tablets, you know, this, we have everything. We are rich in this country beyond measure, and God has given us, allowed us to have those things. And he continues to bless us and gives us everything that we truly need. And so James says here, sin leads to death. But God is all about life. So God can't be touched with temptation or sin or any of that. God is good. He's only going to give good gifts. He gives life. He gives eternal life. So that we could be a kind of first fruits of his creature. That is, that God saves us to be a people for his own possession, a people that is set apart to be holy. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And so James says that we are new creatures, we belong to God, and he is interested in our holiness because he is holy. So he's not going to have anything to do with tempting you to sin. So stop blaming him, he says. And so, James gives us the source of temptation, it's our desire, and the result of temptation is death. Uh, and he tells us that God has nothing to do with it. So just to end, how do we overcome temptation? It doesn't really speak to it that much here, but I uh, just want to give you a few things. Number one, don't blame God for your sin. Don't play the victim. Take responsibility for it. Take responsibility for our own sin. Because we are the ones that are at fault. We are responsible. So that's number one. Number two, Know yourself. Know your tendencies. Know your weaknesses. Know where you struggle. And avoid those situations. Um, get an accountability partner if you struggle with a certain sin. Let somebody else help you. Like, hey, how you doing in this area? Right? Call, call each other up. That's what the church is for. Keep each other accountable. And we need people. That's why we need the church. Otherwise, God would have said, you know, just do it yourself because you don't need anybody else. We do need each other to keep each other accountable. And so know yourself and get an accountability partner. Get somebody uh, to keep you from straying, to keep you living a Christ-like life. Number, th well, I guess three or four, those kind of two. Uh, rest in and dwell on the goodness of God and His gifts. James has laid out for us powerful reasons why God cannot and should not be blamed for our temptation, but these truths are also valuable in helping us overcome Temptation, because God has given us everything that we need, everything of value we have in Jesus Christ. He's given us everything that leads to life in Christ and eternal life. What could, we, what else do we need? Right? He's given us all we need. That's what He's saying. So we don't need to look anywhere else. We don't need to look anywhere else for fulfillment or anything like that. We have it all in Christ. Next, saturate your heart and mind with Scripture which is the very thing that brought you to life in the first place. Psalm 119, 9-11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart, or I have treasured your, heart, your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. We need to be in Scripture. Jesus, when he was tempted, it was an external temptation, but what did he use? He used Scripture. And that's the way we overcome temptation as well. If it's good enough for Jesus, certainly we should be doing the same thing. Because we actually uh, have, have a, a strong desire to sin, even as Christians. And so we need the Word. If we want to keep our way pure, we need to be in the Word. We need to seek God in His Word, His commandments. We need to store up His, His Word in our hearts. And we need prayer. We need to pray. Jesus said in Luke twenty-two forty, 40, Pray that you enter not into temptation. Pray that you enter not into temptation. Ask God to help you avoid those temptations. Because sometimes we think, I got this. I can go in that donut shop and I'm not going to buy a donut. Ooh, it's on sale. 
That's a big one. I've never seen that one before. I guess I'll try it since I'm here. Right? Pray that God would help us because we don't have the strength. We can deceive ourselves into thinking we do, but through the power of the Spirit, we do and we need His help. So don't blame God. Admit your responsibility. Know yourself. Know your weaknesses. You know, grab somebody to keep you accountable. Rest in and dwell on God's goodness. Saturate your heart and mind with Scripture and pray. James says, don't be deceived. It's not God's fault. Don't, don't buy the lie. It's, it's our fault. But rest in the fact that God has purchased you, He loves you, and He desires holiness for you. And so he completes his section on trials and temptation, and he says, when you encounter trials, you have two choices. You can persevere and ask God for help in those trials, or you can give in to temptation to sin. Which choice will we make in our trials? Will we give in to temptation? I pray that we won't. I pray that we would overcome temptation. Let's pray.